Um, I call this uh, meeting of the Lawrence Alliance for Education um, to order. This is our uh, regular May meeting. Uh, if we could uh, begin by all rising and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, we normally go right to uh, public comment. However, um, we have uh, some students who have done some great work uh, that we want to uh, recognize tonight, and they have been patiently um, waiting. Uh, and we have uh, started late. I apologize, but we um, were having a, a professional development session for the board. Um, uh, but so uh, at this time, I want to turn it over to the uh, superintendent to um, share this great news with everyone. We're very, very excited about our guests in the audience today. They are students who have earned the seal of biliteracy. I'm going to invite Carlos Cameron to give us an understanding of what that means, that uh, distinction. And then we're going to ask our students to join us and give them their certificates. Good evening, everyone. The, state, the official state seal of biliteracy provides a means to recognize high school graduates who attained high functional and academic levels of proficiency in English and a foreign language, meaning that those students can function in those languages in authentic real life situations. The state seal of biliteracy takes the form of a seal that appears on the transcript or diploma of the graduating seniors and is a statement of accomplishment for future employers and for college admissions. In our first year of the Seal of Biliteracy program at Lawrence High School, we have 38 students who successfully earned the State Seal of Biliteracy. Of those 38, 13 students earned the State Seal of Biliteracy with distinction. Tonight, we have 14 students here representing the first cohort of achievers to receive the State Seal of Biliteracy in our district. We are pleased that Superintendent Paris and members of the board will present achievement certificates to the students at this session of the Lawrence, Lawrence Alliance for Education board meeting. Please join us in honoring the students as we recognize them and wish them continued success after graduation. So next, I'm gonna ask my colleagues to join me here in the front. I have certificates for them, and I'm gonna call students one by one, and we'd like to recognize you with a certificate. First up is Anai Aguilong. Julian Bautista. <laughs> Mariel Blois. Jennifer Capellam. Gandhi Cartagena.
Elviana de Jesús. Glendaliz de la Cruz. Jean Espinal. Estebaña o Estebanía. Estebanía González. Carlos Reyes. Diana Rodríguez. Santos yeah. Emily City Ellen Vázquez. We're extremely proud of them, and we're going to take one big picture. So bear with us a couple more minutes. We're going to take a picture with the whole group. Omara Acosta. It's always good to have you. 
three minutes, two or two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, that was excellent, and um, we thank the uh, students for joining us. But more than anything, we we say thank you to them for their great work, um, and uh, and we wish them the best uh, as they uh, come up on close to the end of the school year. But um, great job. Uh, at this time, we will uh, take public testimony. I have one person signed up, uh, Mr. Molly. Uh, two minutes. Chester Street. Good evening, honorable members. The budget of Lawrence Public School, the greatest illustration of the goal and aspiration of our leadership. Reviewing the new Lawrence Public School budget clearly shows a budget that intends to offer the best education for our children, motivating our parents and community to be active partner to create the best education. As the great Nelson Mandela said, education indeed the most powerful weapon to change the world. Lawrence Public School now with impeccable leadership by Honorable Cynthia Paris moving forward. Her leadership has made best changes to Lawrence Public School. She is number one champion in creating community partnership. 100 days just lessening. Her great leadership during the September 13 crisis kept our schools open. Citizens are united a petition to request resignation of Massachusetts Attorney General Mara Haley for allowing Columbia gas get away with the murder. My neighbors are still homeless. With the citizen support, our teachers and their union 100%. Million thanks to Honorable Chris Manier for leadership for best facility management. In this election year, support our most hardworking custodial employees with the best raise and union contract. Let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mali. Uh, I want to take a moment just to note that um, the Lawrence Teachers Union has, uh, had, has just had its um, elections, and um, we're all very proud uh, in Lawrence of the uh, strong relationship um, between um, Lawrence Public Schools and the Lawrence Teachers Union and all the great work uh, that goes on um, every day. And we know that a big part of that great work um, for many years was Frank McLaughlin. Um, and uh, he just stepped down. And, and we're really happy to announce that uh, Kim Barry was elected president of the Lawrence Teachers Union. I know that um, she was uh, here tonight. Um, Lori Burnham and uh, Trish Woolley were elected vice presidents. Uh, <laughs> Kathy Delaney, treasurer. Cheryl Travers, financial secretary. Mindy Richardson, recording secretary. And Jen Cahill, corresponding secretary. So congratulations to uh, all the newly elected um, members uh, who make up the leadership of the Lawrence Teachers Union. We're um, uh, so proud uh, of this great accomplishment and so thankful for all of the great work that you and your members do every day. And I would invite um, President Barry to come up to the podium if she'd like to share a few words. Um, uh, we would love to, uh, to hear from her. Thanks so much, Mr. Connolly. And I'd like to thank the board and especially everybody here tonight. Um, we appreciate you taking time and we honor you and all the work that you do and we appreciate everything that you do for the students and the teachers of Lawrence and we hope to work collaboratively to do uh, more great things in the future together. So thanks so much. We're, well, we're very happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to the superintendent for her report um, and, and three um, pieces of business on that. Superintendent? Well, yeah, wonderful. So we've already done our, our bright spots today. Next up, we're going to tee up Kenan Foley, who's our director of ELS, and she's going to be giving us a report on our ed English learner education update. Hi, everyone. I'm Kenan Foley. Um, this is my sixth year in Lawrence as the Director of English Learner Services. 
So um, tonight during this update, we're gonna talk about a few things, um, and I believe you all have the PowerPoint. Thanks, Joan. Um, first, we're gonna discuss the demographics of our English learners, what English learner programming and instruction looks like in Lawrence, how the state evaluates our English learner programs, and what is happening at the state level in terms of new initiatives based on um, the Look Act that was passed in 2017. So who are our English learners? Um, the state definition is up there. So state law defines the term English learner as a student who does not speak English or whose native language is not English and who is not currently able to perform ordinary classroom work in English. Um, it's important to note that the federal definition has changed to English learner, E-L. It's no longer English language learner, E-L-L. So in Lawrence, 35.9% of students in Lawrence are classified as English learners. That is just over 4,900 students. And that number was pulled last Monday, and I know that it changes every day. We have gotten over five students um, since I pulled this number. Um, one interesting piece of data I calculated who are our first year L's, so newly arrived to US schools, and that's based on students who have entered since March 1st of 2018, and there are 760 students in grades one through 12. Um, of our nearly 5,000 English learners, 98.1 um, speak Spanish as a native language. And then in terms of how long, oh, there we go, sorry. In terms of how long students remain classified as English learners and receive services, research indicates that it takes four to seven years to attain academic English language proficiency. So now we're gonna take a look at enrollment, um, starting at the state level. So this slide shows you um, the percent of each district or the highest districts in the state um, percentage of English learner. You can see that we, this is 2018 data, which is why we're just below 35%, um, but we're tied with Worcester for second, just behind Chelsea. And then this is current data in Lawrence, our enrollment as a percent of the district. And I pulled it for the last 10 years so you can just see the trend. Um, even from last year, that 34% now, as of our March Sims data, is up to 35.9%. So I'm gonna go into more detail about each school in the following slides, but I just thought this graphic was helpful in terms of percent of each school. Um, on the high end, you'll see that our schools who have pre-kindergarten and kindergarten are, have a higher percentage of L's, and that's just because of the high number of dual language learners at that age level, and the percentages in pre-K and K of who's classified as an English learner is higher. You'll also see that the Arlington neighborhood schools, Community Day, Tarbox, Arlington Middle, are also on the high end. So here's the breakdown of current EL enrollment by school type. Um, these are early childhood centers. Um, it reads from lowest percentage to highest percentage of English learners. So you have the Lawler, Lawrence Family Public Academy, Rollins, and the Breen. These are our elementary schools, again, from lowest percentage to highest percentage. Frost Elementary with the lowest percentage of English learners, and then Community Day, which has kindergarten and is also in um, the Arlington neighborhood, has the highest percentage. On the next slide, we have our K-8 to schools and SES, which is 1 to 12. We have our middle schools. Again, from lowest to highest. 
and then our high schools. So that's what our enrollment look, looks like, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what our programming and instruction and services for these students looks like. Um, this is kind of a bulky definition, but I think it's helpful. This is this under state and federal law, and uh, under federal law and state guidance, all districts that enroll NELs have to have an English learner education program. And essentially that program needs to meet two goals. One, providing ESL services, so systematic, explicit, and sustained development of Engl English as a second language. And then also meaningful participation in the district's general education program. So opportunity to meet all of the same standards, access all of the same content as non-English learners. So Massachusetts recognizes a few different types of ELE programs, sheltered English immersion, dual language education, or two-way immersion, those are interchangeable, and transitional bilingual education. Due to a lot of history, question two on the ballot in 2002, 92.8% um, of students in Massachusetts are in that first type of program, sheltered English immersion. And that's what we have here in Lawrence. So sheltered English immersion has to meet those two goals that we talked about. And the way that they meet that is first through sheltered content instruction, which is provided by a content area licensed and SEI endorsed teacher. The sheltered content provides that access to grade level content and then the development of content specific academic language. For example, an, a math teacher in an SEI program employs a number of strategies to ensure that all L's can access the math standards of that classroom. And then the second component of SEI is ESL instruction. That is the component that's provided by an ESL licensed teacher, and it involves systematic, explicit, sustained language instruction in the context of the frameworks. So as you may know, all public school districts participate in the public school monitoring process every six years. And this was our six year cycle. So our last one was completed in 2013. So 2019, we just completed ours. I'll talk about that. But for English learner education, the process is led by the Office of Language Acquisition at DESE. And it's called tiered focused monitoring. This year, as a part of our tiered focus monitoring process, the department collected data via a self-assessment, visited schools, classrooms, interviewed staff to evaluate us on these 13 criteria that you see here. And these 13 criteria reflect federal and state laws and regulations. So how did we do? Um, our final report from DESE came out last, just last week. There were two findings related to these 13 criteria, which is down from nine findings in our last cycle. And the two findings were in ELE 5 and ELE 17. So ELE 5 is, has to do with the programming that we're talking about, and I, I put the full text from the state there, but highlighted that they they found that English learners are not demonstrating sufficient growth in English language acquisition, and also that the district does not have enough ESL staff to implement our ELE program in Fidelity. ELE 17 has to do with program evaluation um, and submitting evidence that we have evaluated our program. So the next step is that we will develop a corrective action plan by the end of this month in partnership with DESE, and then they will do progress monitoring until we've fully implemented these two items. So what's new in English learner education? As I mentioned before, there's a lot. Um, on November 22nd, 2017, 
the Language Opportunity for Our Kids Act was signed into law by Governor Baker. Um, this is something that advocates in the English learner world had been working on for years. So it was a really exciting moment. And the Look Act has many components that impact English learner education. I'm gonna share some of the highlights. So one thing again, has to do with programming. Um, the Look Act allows for flexibility in English learner programming, so implementing one of those other programs. Um, and we're currently in the early stages of exploring the possibility of implementing one of um, those state-sanctioned ELE programs. The Look Bill also requires increased input from parents and guardians, primarily in the form of developing an English Learner Parent Advisory Council, or LPAC, which is similar to the CPAC. Um, and LPS hosted an information session and planning meeting for the new LPAC this spring. And we will launch next year with a welcome event for families in September, and then monthly meetings. And similar to a CPAC, this will be parent-run parent and parent-led with support from the district as requested. Another component of the Look Bill has to do with student achievement and setting benchmarks for students. So the state has set benchmarks for English proficiency for students, which is really exciting. It also requires that districts identify students who have not made progress towards attaining English language proficiency and create a plan for them that has personalized goals, interventions, parental input, et cetera. Um, so this year, all schools have implemented the English Learner Success Plan, and we look forward to expanding that opportunity and, and process to more students next year. And then last but not least, um, as you saw earlier, the state seal of biliteracy was a part of the Look Bill, which we're really excited about. Um, and as you heard, we just this was just a pilot year with 38 students earning the state seal of biliteracy, 13 with distinction. And again, we're really excited to expand that initiative next year. Thank you for advocating for our English learners, always. And I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I just I, I want to open with one. I know we have a number of um, folks who want to. Kenan, it's great to see you. Hi. Um, I want to note just on the presentation the number of um, uh, implemented requirements um, is, is impressive and indicative of, of being on the right track and doing good work. I, I am just curious relative to the strategy to address the uh, one partially implemented and one um, flagged as not implemented, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, we just received this last week, so we'll be working with DESE. Um, ELE 17 is a, a pretty simple explanation. Um, we'll be submitting a program evaluation with the department by the end of this calendar year. So that should be relatively short. And ELE 5 is much more complicated. Um, I imagine that a lot of urban districts um, struggle with the same things that we were cited for. Um, so we're hoping to add some ESL staff in the coming year um, to address the second part of that concern and then also increasing the percentage of students making progress on the access. Last year we switched, was our first year doing full online testing um, and it went as smoothly as it could have gone for a first year of online testing. but it was much improved this year, so we also expect to see some change. So in terms of um, our corrective action plan, we'll be actively monitoring English language proficiency achievement and making sure we get our access data just back in about two weeks, so that might have already changed. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna take questions from uh, members now. Gabby, I think, did you have your hand up for a question? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Pat? Yes, hi. Um, can you tell me about what percentage of teachers um, in the district are SEI endorsed? 
That's a great question. So the retail initiative started in 2013, the year that I came here, and um, we have over 95% of teachers SEI endorsed. Um, most of the unendorsed teachers, of core academic teachers, so it's core academic only, it's not specialists. Um, but we do, most of the teachers who don't have it yet are new hires, and we offer a district-wide course for new hires every year. All right, and just as a follow-up, um, do we have any program within the district that encourages teachers to go further to get their ESL um, certification? We partner with UMass Lowell for a national, th through a national professional development grant for, that was a five-year grant. Um, we reapplied for that and it did not, we did not get it. Um, so that ended in 2017 and UMass Lowell, um, but th so through that program we had teachers um, encouraged to go and do an add-on certificate in ESL. All right, and also um, you're talking about a different program. Which program are you leaning towards? I don't know. I, I taught in both a transitional bilingual and dual language program when I was a teacher. Um, it's, it's complex. I think we're excited to have the LPAC really think about which program um, might work best and get input from parents as to kind of learn more about the programs and which program they think would best suit the students. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Noemi. Yeah, I have two questions and it's related to the questions that you guys made and he's going back to slides 14 and the um, the partially implemented number five. Yep. So the question is, did you think that one of the reasons the students uh, didn't demonstrate sufficient growth is in part because you don't have enough of the staff? Or do you think that it's a little bit more complicated than that? It's definitely more complicated than that, and I mm -hmm. think it's a school by school analysis okay. as to all the factors as to why a school, mm -hmm. students at a specific school are performing well or not performing well, but um, I, I absolutely think that ESL staff is one of those factors. Okay, and then the other question is related to what Pat said. Um, you know, with the dual language ed or the uh, transitional bilingual education, do you know um, example of what is being done in other states? You know, to look at the data to figure out based on the you know type of population that we have here, what would be best suitable for our students? That will be number one, and number two is is the intention to adopt a different uh, alternative for all of the schools or there would be flexibilities of some schools adopt one and other schools adopt another one? It would definitely be on a small scale, especially to start, so not mm -hmm. all schools. Mm -hmm. um, research, there's a lot of research around dual language education. Um, in, uh, there are two types of dual language education programs. There's, there's two-way immersion mm -hmm. where 50% of the students do not speak the partner language, 50% 50 per, 50 do speak the partner language. Um, in Lawrence, over 70% of our students have a native language of Spanish, even if they are not classified as an English learner. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that I really want the LPAC to look into is the one-way immersion, where they don't necessarily, students who speak the partner language aren't necessarily excluded from that program. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Julia. Thank you, Jen. Uh, just a couple of questions based on the high enrollment, including pre-K and K um, students. Does the school um, do any type of research to determine U.S. born uh, children when they come into the the school system versus the newcomers to determine whether they, they will be placed in the EL uh, classes or in, on a regular, in a regular immersion class? Yes, so um, there's a very intensive intake process for English learners, so our ESL teachers at each school, essentially when a student registers and they indicate a language other than English on the home language survey, which 98% of the students who have enrolled this year indicate were eligible to be screened, um, go to the school level, and then the ESL teachers, who are really the language experts, administer a screening assessment. So at the pre-K level, it's called the pre-IPT oral. At the kindergarten level, it's the kindergarten WAPT. Um, 
And then what happens is there's a language acquisition team at each school that includes an administrator, an ESL teacher, a special educator, along with some other members, and they help to determine if the student should be classified as an English learner using other data, um, including you know family interviews, especially at that young age, um, other local diagnostic data, and other factors as well. How, how involved are the parents in, in this decision-making process as to whether their child should be in a regular classroom or a, an EL classroom? Um, all parents have the option to opt out of English learner services. So they receive a notification letter once the student is classified as an English learner and they have the opportunity to opt out. And are we as a school district receiving the same amount of funds for a regular uh, student versus a, an EL student? I don't know the answer to that question. It's the complicated question because we just had training on um, different right. models, and so the answer is uh, we do get additional funding, but it's allocated differently, as you just learned. Right, and could this maybe, a, a parent could probably be putting down that their child speaks Spanish at home, which is, you know, the, the, the language that we're discussing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the child might not benefit from being immersed in a regular classroom, especially at that early age? And could the, the fact that we're receiving more funding for these students um, be a determining factor so, for, for the school to decide where to place this child? So all English learners are in regular classrooms. We don't have self-contained classrooms. So they're placed in the same classroom as every other student. Every s classroom in the district, aside from a few at Abbott Lawrence Academy, have an English learner in, a, in the classroom. So all of our classrooms are th this SI, SEI model, essentially. So it's not that students are classified as English learners and they're segregated. They just receive the, in the additional instruction, the English as a second language instruction. Um, so there's no motivation um, to classify students, but we hope that through this rigorous intake process that the ESL teachers do along with the language acquisition team, if they have a question, even if the student doesn't do well on the English intake, English proficiency intake assessment, that they're I know that our ESL teachers talk with the family, and you know, even if they checked that they speak Spanish, they, you know, English is their primary language, and that's what they use to make the decision. Um, kind of lost my train of thought, but <laughs> uh, it's on that same line in terms of um, if the child, have we made as a school district any type of decision in term or any any pilot programs? Have we ever created any pilot programs where you might? We might want to take some of those pre-K and K students coming in and just uh, place them in a full immersion program rather than the EL. That's one part of the question. And the second part, and, and I'll let you go with this one, is what type of um, teaching is done at that level in the EL program? Sorry, just to reiterate, all pre-K and K students are in full, I think you're, you're I, meaning I full that. immersion. They're yes. in general education. So have we done a pilot to segregate them separately? Mm -hmm. um, no, we have not. And then this, what is the teaching? Methods, what exactly is taught to these children at that level? During? Or the bilingual por portion it of it. It varies by grade level, and then also in our school autonomy, the method of servicing students and the curriculum used varies by school. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yep. So Julia, just to add on, if you are in one of our preschools, what you'll see is that all students are being delivered with the same curriculum in English. Mm -hmm. And then there might be instances where small groups of students are being pulled out or the teacher pushes in to support based on the different levels. But in an early learning center, 
it's pretty homogeneous. They, you know, they're all at the same level one, we'll say, or just beginning. And so the instructions deliver fully in English okay. with sheltering, which includes a lot of visuals, a lot of repetition, and um, a lot of structure around the content. I, I, just, I just wanted to make this point because I feel that if these children are placed in, in regular classrooms, even though they, they are, but they're being taken out you know, according to their needs, that they might do better in learning than by being placed, being taken out of, of their classrooms to teach them something in another language. Because even though in the home they might be speaking a, a different language, children are exposed to a lot of the uh, English content uh, programs that they see at home. So that's the, the whole point for my uh, questions. Especially because I lived this with my own children many years ago, but I did. And it was based, the need was based more on how much money the school district was getting for each child more so than the needs of the child at that time. Yeah, you would be happy to know that that's quite different now. And so if you walk into our classrooms, you'll see that differentiation in the upper grades specifically because students come in at different levels, but all of our classrooms in general ed are fully taught in English with support and sheltering in native language instruction, but with the big emphasis of accelerating their English. Thank you. John, I have a few questions. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so my first question, and I realize this might be complicated, but Aside from the fact that it seems that we're saying that we do need more ESL teachers, what are some of the other factors that are leading to us not making the gains that we would like to see with our students? I think any, when, when we're talking about English learners, we're talking about all of our students, right? Mm -hmm. We have, if you look at our ever EL percentage, which I couldn't pull from the DESE website, so many of our students have been English learners and also so many of our students are academic English learners, as a lot of students are. Um, so when you think about any component about why are we not meeting gain, making targets on MCAS, why, it's, it's the same components. Um, so I think specific challenges for English learners are is um, entering the school year at different points. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, we have 760 students in there um, f that arrived after March 1st of 2018. So I think specifically with English learners, it can be disjointed education. Um, but again, it's very specific to the school in terms of how their English learners are doing and what factors go into that success or challenge. I don't know if you. Okay, I, I mean, I just ask, I, I know that it's a complicated question. I just think that we have to start to unravel that if we're gonna figure out how to improve it. Of right? course. So, yeah. Um, and then my second question is, is just sort of, the presentation that we had at the beginning of this highlights this for me, where, you know, I think we're clearly as a society coming to recognize the power of bilinguality and of, of being bicultural too. And, you know, if those kids were still here, I would say don't stop at two languages, like get a third one, because that's the way the world is going. So what stops us? and aside from the obvious resources, right, of having a program that, can t that takes advantage of the fact that we have so many Spanish-speaking families in our system and that, like, and, and that pursues a bilingual education strategy that is teaching all students to become even more fluent and conversive and high level in their family's native language as well as in English, because recognizing that that's a really powerful, you know, sort of career and personal tool to have, right? And it's important for someone to remain connected to their culture of origin. And, and I feel like it's a, it would be an awesome 
opportunity also for students who might be second or third generation and are losing some of that language capacity or it's not being spoken at home or it feels like, you know, I, and I, I know this is probably a question of resources, but is there a way for us to structure our programs where we're helping to students to advance in their native language and we're, we're starting to, like, we're teaching Spanish as a matter of course in the early grades as well as English so that students are growing up fully bilingual in, bo in both of those. I, I completely agree and that's why we're excited about the flexibility in program, programming from the Look Bill and that's why we're gonna be exploring dual, specifically dual language education which is what you just, just described where students mm -hmm not only are taking Spanish classes, if, we, if Spanish is the partner language, they're actually learning content in both languages yeah. and are fully bilingual, which is really exciting and, and why we're looking at that. That's great. I'm yeah. really glad to hear that. Oh, cool. Any other questions? Okay, Superintendent. No, I think we're good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kitty. Yeah, next up we're going to have Long, and I think Anne-Marie might be joining. He's going to give us a brief update about information systems and technology report. Good evening, everyone. My name is Long Nguyen, Director of the Information System and Technology. Uh, so I'd like to start off with some numbers that hopefully give you a better overview of the operation of the ICT department. Um, so currently, the ICT department has eight staff members plus one vacancy that the job is being posted for. And then actually compared to the other district of the same size, we are pretty small. If you look at the other numbers on the list, that it's quite a long list, but I'm going to draw your attention to some of the big numbers there. Uh, 2,400 um, staff email accounts and 14,000 uh, email accounts for students and 9,800 Chromebooks for students plus many thousands of iPads, computers, desktop computers, laptop computers, 1,500 phones, 1,500 phones and 78 fax lines. So if you look at the numbers, at uh, those numbers, those are the ones that we have to support and make sure hopefully they work every day. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the list of projects that the ICT department has been running throughout the school year, starting with the Chromebooks for the students at the school and deploying laptops to the teachers and school specialists and school administrators. And we also do the Power School parent student portals. And then the last thing on the list is e rate funding applications. I'm going to go into each one of them in details. So starting this school year, 2018-2019, the state requires that every student from third grade to 10th grade taking MCAT testing online. So we have to look at a number of mobile devices for the students for them to make sure that everyone has a device to take the MCAT testing online. So starting at the beginning of the school year, we had about 7,400 grown books. And throughout the school years until now, we have been able to purchase more than 2,000 Chromebooks through the local funding and other source of funding. And then as it is now, we have 9,800 Chromebooks for the students. So compared to the number of students that we have for third grade to 10th grade, it's about 84, 8,500 students. So every student taking MCAS online would have one device for them. And then the second thing that we also do is to increase the mobility of the uh, school staff, especially teachers in the classrooms, by deploying laptop computers, replacing the desktop computers in the classrooms, and then also to teachers, to school specialists, and school administrators. So starting the planning way back in July 2018, the first deployment we did was into September 2018. And so far, we still continue doing so. And uh, 992 laptop computers have been uh, deployed. Each one of them comes with three year warranty that cover the accidental damage, lost and stolen. So we actually go for three years. The next thing we have on the list is um, 
to improve the communication between the parents, students, and the schools. We have been working with the schools to set up the portals for parents and students. So with the logins, any student, any parent can log in and check their attendance, check on the homework assignments, and check on the grades. And then it's been going very well so far, but not all of them online yet. So we still continue doing so. The last one I have on my list is the E-RED funding applications. Just to give you some background information on the E-RED funding, way back in 2006, 2007, every year we probably got about $500,000 every year for around $350,000 went to the internet connection for all the schools, and then $100,000 for Verizon phone services, and the other probably for Verizon cell phone service and other networking and cabling in the school. And out of that money, we are only required to pay 10%. So let's say you got $500,000, you rent, and then you are only required to pay 50,000 of that, 450,000 being covered by the E-rate funding. And the 90% rate actually comes from the rate of the number of students having free and reduced lunch at the school. So as it is now, we are around 80 something, 90 something somewhere there. And then currently this year, we apply for $442,000 for the internet connection at all the schools. And out of that, we pay for 10%. So we probably more, I, I'm probably more than 90% we will get it because for the past more than 10 years, we always get it. But the big thing about this uh, funding this year is we apply for fiber connection because so far we have to pay about $500,000 a year to connect all schools together. Um, for last, I think 10 years or maybe more longer than that, the city decided to connect all city buildings with fiber. But for some reason, the school buildings were not on the list. So we still have to pay, um, as it is how we pay Comcast, $400,000 to connect all of them so that one school can talk to the other and talk back to the district office. So with the fiber connection funding, it's about $750,000. If we get it approved, we pay about 70 or maybe 100,000, and the rest will be covered by e rate funding. That would help us to, first thing, that whenever we need more network bandwidth for the school, we just increase them. Just adding some you know, pieces of equipment here and there. Don't have to pay any more lease. Second thing is, we never know how long the E-rate funding will last. So we kind of reduce the dependence upon them. Even though I said the E-rate funding application is the last on the list, but actually it's the best making money machine for us because for the last 10 years, we make like more than half a million dollars every year. And then especially 2015, 2016, we got $2.2 million. $500,000 went to the E-rate for the internet service and the phone service. $1.7 million went to upgrade all the schools with new networking equipment and around almost 1,000 wireless access points throughout the school. So that allows the Wi-Fi connection at the school probably 99% cover. So that's not pretty much that's all I have for the IT. And then so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions? I just, I just have one, one question. The Chromebooks, are, are um, those, the, do they belong to the school system or do the students get to keep them? Um, as it is now, they still belong to the school system and they, we send them to the schools and they be, the school will manage them. But okay. they don't go home with the students. Oh, they don't go home with the no, students? No, they don't go home with the students. So they just manage. used it while in school. Okay, and same thing with teachers or? The teachers' laptops, actually, it's up to the school discretion because we want to increase the mobility of the teachers. So they may take it home to do projects at home, this and that. And especially summer, we want to have them on back so we can kind of clean them up, do things, mm -hmm. installing new things. But if the teachers happen to have any projects with the school, then it's up to the principals to decide whether they can take them home or not. All right, thank you. Pat? Yes, hi, Long. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm interested in the parent portal. 
How far along are you in the district about what percentage of schools uses the parent portal? I would say probably about 40%. Some schools have more parents using them than students. Some school, some other schools, students using them more. So it's not really kind of um, in, in terms of numbers. When do, you, when do you anticipate the entire district will be using the parent portal? I would hope that probably next school year, but it depends mostly from the, on the school because the only requirement we have from the school is to have some designated staff, most likely somebody working the office so that we can train that person and then we help them to set up the portal. Because imagine that we have to deal with 14,000 something students and plus parents who call in for forget the past school. Then, you know, we like to have them handle at the school level. Does the high school use the parent portal? The high school actually are using them a lot more because they have a lot more in terms of the uh, student attendance and homework assignments. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Jess, your streak will be broken if you don't ask a question on this. Uh, okay, well, we'll let that record go then. Um, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you, Long. It. Thank you. Next up, we're going to have Mary Toomey give us a student services report. And as you know, this is a new role for Mary Toomey, so we're very excited about that. Good evening, everyone. I must say, after listening to Long, I'm very guilty about the number of times that I email help desk. <laughs> Gonna have to watch that. I'm really happy to be here tonight to share with you our vision for our new Office of Student Support Services and what our plans are moving forward for next school year. So the Office of Student Support Services is something that we want to combine uh, some of the departments that have been working now uh, individually into one area. And we want to do that so that we can focus not only on academics, but on the social and emotional needs of all of our students as well. We're really tasked with creating and maintaining programs for all of our kiddos, no, no matter where they uh, fall on the learning continuum. And we want our programming, obviously, to focus on students with disabilities, but we want to make sure that we're paying attention to students who may be served with a Section 504 accommodations, um, looking at our academic intervention services and how we might be able to improve those, and also uh, taking a look at our response to intervention, our ITI process, and making that a more robust process. At the same time, we want to include the student health and wellness services, uh, our school counselors, and supports for social emotional learning so that everything that we're doing is all pointing in the same direction and that all of our resources are, are combining to meet the needs of the whole child. We're planning to detail lots of this information along with resources for parents on our website on or about July 1st. <clears throat> so we're giving you just an overview tonight of the vision and the direction we're going. Um, as we head into year one next year, which will be our launch year. Essentially, this office will provide a continuum of specialized services that's really focused on, first, on advocacy. We want to ensure that all of the staff working for the office, as well as all of our schools, are really holding advocacy as a high priority that we're advocating for all learners, we're advocating for our families, and we're ensuring that all kids are getting exactly what they need. We want to also um, make sure that all of our educators are holding high expectations for our learners, and that our instruction is always student-centered, and that that word all really does mean all. So we have this sort of ladder of support that's going to start with really taking a look at what response to intervention and instruction has been and how that RTI model functioning as a pre-referral mechanism can be improved 
uh, in order to really support those types of interventions that are meaningful for students and actually lead to us not going down that road to evaluation if we don't have to, if our interventions are working well. We also want to consider our student health and wellness supports that are there to uh, really help all of our students with those um, things that are associated with academics, very important to ensuring that they're prepared and ready to learn. And our school counselors um, are, are essential personnel in all of our schools and, and play a very important role to the, just the peer relationships and the school health of our kids and we just want to be sure that they are also embraced as part of this plan. And most of our schools have been working on social emotional learning um, ideas and supports and we want to just bring those together so that we're all rowing in the same direction around what SEL is and how that informs um, everything else that we're doing in the schools. And finally, we um, will include our special education services as part of this um, tiered program of support. The multi-tiered system of supports, which is what the state refers to as um, you know, the, a response to intervention program is a process that emphasizes how well students respond to changes in instruction. And we have to be sure that when we're using RTI and multi-tiered systems that we're using research-based instruction and interventions that we are monitoring and we're measuring student progress over time. And it has to be followed in a, in a very thoughtful and meaningful way, and that the use of the measures must shape instruction to help us make educational decisions. So one piece that we want to do for the new school year is to just provide some increased professional development to our principals um, who are interested in um, ensuring that this process uh, has a place in their school and becomes more robust for them. The core features of um, the program are to ensure that we have high quality instruction as well as behavioral support within general education. Not everything that we do in the Office of Student Support Services is around um, students identified with special needs. Many things that we can do can happen ahead of a time when students are identified. We want to ensure universal screening of academics and behavior to determine students for closer monitoring or additional interventions and ensuring that we have the support to get that done. And having multiple tiers of increasingly intense interventions that are matched to student need will be really helpful to ensure that um, every child is getting what he or she needs. And we want it to be collaborative. We want to develop it together, implement it together, monitor it together with a team-based approach. Um, it's very important. And having continuous monitoring of our student progress during the interventions and the instruction using objective information and determining if our students are meeting their goals. Also having follow-up measures providing the information so that the intervention and instruction was implemented as intended and with the appropriate consistency. We want to document um, parent involvement throughout the process. It's really important that the parent is involved and is another thought partner uh, in helping us to design what this multi-tiered system will look like. Um, and then making sure that we're paying close attention to evaluation timelines that are specified um, under the regulations uh, and um, we're following them as we're supposed to. Student health and wellness, we have a, a, a wonderful cadre of registered nurses, LPNs, um, in every school that are really supporting the health and wellness of our students and ensuring that um, there's also a close relationship with community-based health providers uh, just so that we have access to all of the resources that we need. So these folks are really critical to us. Um, we also have school-based psychological services in place um, to meet the needs, the assessment, mental health needs of our students um, when those are needed. Our plans for the new school year, including um, tapping a lead registered nurse who will be assigned to enhance the support and the communication uh, partnerships, be that liaison between 
um, the district office, and the schoolhouse for all of the health providers that we're working with. So we're excited about that. And um, just ensuring that our mission is to actively promote school-based health, um, uh, student fitness, and healthy student behaviors, where we uh, certainly can do that. Um, and the coordinated approach is really to ensure health education is happening, uh, robust physical education and physical activity is happening in all of our schools, um, that we have uh, school nutrition happening and um, school-based health care, um, out-of-school time services, and health education happening in all of our schools as well. We want to increase the equity of health and wellness resources across our schools. School adjustment and guidance counseling services also provide a comprehensive program um, to promote academic and college career, uh, social emotional growth of our students all across our grades, pre-K through 12th grade. Um, these counselors advocate for our kids. They uh, collaborate with educators. They are critical and essential to what goes on every single day. And um, you know, in light of um, all of the uh, issues that kids are facing in you know, the, the world that we're living in, it's essential to have folks there at the schoolhouse who can be that support. Um, again, we want to ensure that we have a lead school counselor assigned to enhance the support, be that communicator, be that liaison between the schools, the counselors, and the, the district office. Um, we want to make sure that our counselors can assist students at all levels, and again, that they're acting as advocates for students' well-being as a valuable resource for their education. They assist with things like bullying, um, disabilities, self-esteem, uh, academic performance, and relationship concerns. And they also maintain partnerships with community agencies and mental health providers so that when those agencies are needed, they make the appropriate referrals. Um, a little more about school counseling and guidance. They evaluate students' abilities. They uh, take a look at their interests and their personalities. And they really help our kids develop realistic uh, academic and career goals. And they're also charged with a few more responsibilities, listening to their concerns, be they academic, emotional, or social, ensuring that our schools have a gender-neutral safe space for all of our kids' needs, helping students process their problems along with planning for their goals and actions, and being a mediator, helping them to learn to mediate conflict between students and students, students and teachers, all of that work is important. Our counselors also help with the parent-teacher relationship, and they assist at the high school level with college applications, jobs, scholarships, um, just getting ready for the career force. They facilitate substance um, prevention programs, and they organize peer counseling programs and groups when appropriate, and they refer students to psychologists and other mental health resources as appropriate. So these people are critical. Social emotional learning is an area that most of our schools have been um, very interested in in the last couple of years. Um, it's the process by which children and adults understand and manage their emotions set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. So it's no small piece. Um, ensuring social emotional uh, learning is happening is critical and essential to kids being prepared and ready to learn academically. So ensuring that our schools are committed to promoting um, systemic SEL across multiple contexts is really important. But another piece that we have to reinforce is that it's more than a program or a lesson. We, there's lots of folks that are you know, um, peddling um, SEL programs, a big buzzword, you know, so buy this program, buy that package. It's not just a curriculum. It's about how teaching and learning happens. It's about what is taught. It's about where students learn. Um, there are five core competencies that, when they're prioritized, they help educate hearts, inspire minds, and they help students navigate the world. It, it's really a mindset that all of our educators, everyone who's working in our schools, has to come with um, to ensure that social, emotional health and well-being of all our students is 
the primary concern and focus in each of our schools. So those key areas, um, and there, there are five of them, include self-awareness, self-management, uh, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So there's a little definition of each of those there. But ensuring that our kids have access to these key areas and that they understand them and that they're practicing tools that help them um, with these five key areas is critical for their success as they go grade by grade and then they move on um, uh, and learn how to manage uh, different aspects of uh, conflict that may arise and uh, their goals for the future. We want to increase professional learning so that the, the circles that are going around the SEL wheel that you see on the graphic, which are home, school, and classroom, that those efforts are continuously revolving around each school's SEL wheel so that they know that it isn't just about one or the other. It really is about all three happening uh, at the same time. So we need everybody on board with that. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and the 504 plan, you may know a little bit about already. It uh, prohibits discrimination against people with disability. Um, it also is a plan that is developed for any child who has a disability identified under the law and is attending an elementary or secondary uh, school, and that that child can receive accommodations to ensure their academic success uh, and access to the learning environment. Uh, an impairment, as it's described and defined in 504, includes any disability, long-term illness, or various disorder that substantially reduces or lessens a student's ability to access learning in the educational setting because of a learning behavior or health-related condition. And so this is the big differential here, this next bullet. For students with disabilities who do not require specialized instruction, but need the assurance that they will receive equal access to public education and services, a 504 plan is created for those particular students, and it allows them um, specific accessibility, um, access, and uh, accommodations that will support them. So it's different than um, the specialized instruction that's required in an IEP. So we want to make sure that our schools understand and are, are fully embracing and ready to support students who uh, may qualify for services under 504. These plans must and be updated annually to ensure that the student is receiving the accommodations that they need. And so now, um, getting up to our uh, final step on this plan for our new Office of Student Support is a special education redesign. Um, this department has been called Student Learning Services for the last few years. Most families and educators refer to it as special education, so we're going to go back to that title. Um, we're committed to nurturing and celebrating the special talents and differences of every learner. We want to ensure that every staff member is charged with the responsibility of celebrating students for their abilities. We want to ensure that all students are included with appropriate levels of support. That's required. And we must strive to embrace diversity, persist in our quest for equity, uh, and empower our learners to believe in the value of effort, perseverance, determination, you know, that thing that we all know as grit. Um, it's, it's really helpful. Uh, for us to ensure that our kids, um, you know, have that attitude and they understand that, um, you know, they can do it. Within special education, students receive academic and therapeutic interventions at all levels from pre-K all the way through uh, the completion of secondary, secondary education or until they transition to adult services. This redesign uh, that we're planning that we're going to share with you now um, will hopefully ensure comprehensive and consistent leadership, strong systems, and a continuum of program supports to each LPS school. We want to focus on effective and sustainable practices that are enhanced by the statewide system of supports that includes the district's five-year strategic inclusion plan. Um, Dr. Bergeron is leaving us in very good hands with all of the work that was done prior. Um, to this uh, redesign coming up with the five-year strategic plan for inclusion and the foundation that's been 
um, put in place as a result of that plan and the work that's come before. This new redesign will create zones from school feeder patterns to maximize support, balance caseloads, and enhance the continuum of services, um, also to just enhance communication and how we're delivering service now to a large number of schools and a large number of students across the district. This restructure is going to um, take a look at shifting some of the existing staffing assignments. We want to do that so that we can improve collaboration and transitions for our students so that there's a continuum all the way from pre-K right through um, you know, where they're going uh, in all of their um, grades. Um, we have to provide adequate levels of support. We're recommending a few key positions just to start. Um, we know we need additional support in speech and language pathology. Um, our occupational therapists uh, can use additional support as well. We're seeing many, many more students um, coming in with sensory issues. There's, there's been a lot of need for, um, for that. And um, we also know that um, we have a need for certified Spanish language interpreters. So we want to um, also increase there to begin. Another big um, piece that we're actually returning to is reinstating the early intervention screening team. We're gonna call it the EAST. Uh, we can never have enough acronyms in the Lawrence Public Schools, so we have another one. Um, and this will improve the family experience as the first introduction to the Lawrence Public Schools. These children are referred to us as young as two years, nine months from the early intervention program. And our proposal includes the assignment of a dedicated team to support all of our early intervention pre-K students. We want to schedule evaluations in an arena to ensure that families are served by multiple providers during the same visit. Should take about an hour, and that way uh, many of our providers can see the family, interview the family, um, evaluate the student at the same time. We are um, proposing that we home base the EAST team at the Rollins Early Childhood Center. It lived there in the past. Um, now we have uh, moved it on to several different sites, but we want to kind of um, pull our resources together and see if we can't do it with a, uh, with a dedicated team back at the Rollins. This centralized teaming with multiple therapeutic disciplines will improve the efficiency and will also maximize collaboration of these providers um, as they're working to, de to determine uh, what the next steps are for these children. So here's a peek. This is a peek at the new plan. Um, this is zone one. Um, in each of the four zones that we've identified, um, and you can see by looking at the schools across the bottom of the screen, that the schools that are connected together in each of the um, boxes are feeder pattern schools. So if you're a student who starts at the Lawler, you're likely gonna go to the Leahy or the Tarabox, and then the Up Leonard School. So that's your feeder pattern. So the idea is that along with a zone um, director, a special, special education administrator who's directing the zone, and the ancillary support uh, providers that are listed in the chart there, those people become the team for this zone one. They communicate directly with these principals. They communicate directly with these families. Each one of the four zones will begin with approximately 500 to 600 students identified with special needs. That doesn't include the students who will be um, recommended for an additional uh, in, in, an initial evaluation during the year or those students that are um, eligible for a 504 plan or the students that we want to include in the RTI process uh, model as well. However, it does give a manageable number of um, students for which the administrator and the related service providers can um, meet and discuss and determine what the best um, routes are for supporting that child as they move through. So right now, just wanted to show you that, um, you know, we did base this on the percentage of students that are currently identified with special needs in each one of the schools and looking at the number so that we can determine that um, we do have adequate staffing um, going uh, to each one of these zones. This might shift 
some, but we think we're in pretty good shape moving forward to at least have this preliminary plan um, available and moving in terms of uh, where we go next. Um, you can see here that the next slide shows you the, the second zone. This is where the EAST program, the Early Intervention Screening Team, will live in Zone 2. And again, you know, just shared um, support. There will be an interpreter, uh, certified Spanish language interpreter in each one of the zones. And you can see that each zone has approximately four evaluation team facilitators who chair the meetings, connect with parents, um, about, about the needs of the child um, and really connect the, the, the teaching staff and the principal with the families regarding that. So having one interpreter um, in each zone means that with four ETFs, that interpreter can be assigned to a different ETF for four days of the week, and then the fifth day can support and help um, you know, those uh, therapists who um, need to do new evaluations and who might need an interpreter or translator to do a home assessment with a family or some other evaluation. So you can see how that's playing out there. And again, this is just the zone two numbers, so you could take a look at that. And in zone three, here are the next um, schools that you can see. Again, the feeder patterns. Weatherby is by itself there because that is our uh, only K-8 to school where that's the feeder pattern. If you're fortunate enough to be at the Weatherby and you start as a kindergartner, you may be able to stay there all the way through eighth grade. So um, again, you can see how that will work um, very nicely with the support and with the team. Um, the idea is to really increase communication. The idea is that if I am in, if I am working as a therapist in zone three and um, you know I have a colleague at one of those schools that I'm not assigned to primarily, who has several additional um, evaluations to do in a particular month that I may be able to go over there and support um, that colleague. So that this team works together in support of getting um, the needs done. And then finally, um, zone four will be reserved for our grade nine through 12 teams, our high schools, lower school and upper school, obviously, as well as our uh, high school programs, Abbott and Lasse and Rise and the International High School and the High School Learning Center. Um, again, um, you know, having a, a dedicated team that's going to service the needs. Um, there is a note on there. We, we have had a LIFE program functioning sort of as an independent program in the past at the high school. We're going to integrate those students across the campus um, as part of the five-year uh, inclusion plan that was laid out. That's uh, one of the next steps that we need to consider. So that's our plan to do that. The numbers that you see there in yellow are not accurate because um, DESE reports our special education numbers now by the campus and not by individual programs, but we will fill those in with the actual numbers and not just the average, just so we can get a good sense and be sure that we have all of our support articulated um, appropriately before we actually make assignments um, moving forward. Here's our communication timeline. This afternoon, I had the opportunity to run this presentation with all of our principals in the district. I'm very happy for their support. Uh, ask them to roll up their sleeves. It's, it's certainly gonna be a, a team effort where we're gonna work very closely together um, to uh, ensure that uh, we get this done for every, every child. Um, this evening, I'm with you uh, tomorrow. Uh, Superintendent Paris and I will be meeting with the CPAC, and then on Friday we have a, a briefing for special education ancillary staff, and then on Monday the clerical staff that work for the department um, and the Office of Student Support will we'll meet and uh, we'll discuss some roles with them. And that brings me to seeing if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to make up for my lack of questions on the last presentation. Um, so I have a bunch of questions that range all over the place. And the first one is just actually on this last slide. Are you guys going to do an overview for school committee as well? If that's the superintendent's pleasure, I'm, I'm sure we will do that. Yes, I will be doing that. OK, that would be great. Um, so I, my first question is kind of goes all the way back to that health and wellness slide, and this is sort of a special pet peeve of mine, and I do want to 
give a shout out to the Leahy School staff who have had to deal with me on this issue and have been very responsive and wonderful about it. Um, but the, this issue, the issue of recess, right? I, I've been reading up a lot about this because I feel like, you know, just common sense as a parent, you know your child's in school for eight hours a day and um, these little bodies need time to run and play and physical activity is super important for both physical health and mental health. Absolutely. And, you know, yet it seems like in most schools the standard is like 15 minutes of recess and 10 minutes of lunch. And that, and when I look at, you know, sort of schools in more privileged areas around the country and wealthier areas, there's substantially more recess. And I've been doing some reading around this and sort of the, there's proven benefits to increasing that recess time across the board in terms of student ability to focus and perform better and so on. And I've also had conversations with, with teachers and administrators around the idea that, you know, and I, I understand that, and I understand this as a parent too, right? We all need like effective consequences and behavior modification tools, but it does seem like taking away recess as a consequence for bad behavior seems like it should be something of last resort. And, I, and I'm and i sure this varies from school to school, but I'm wondering, uh, so all of that grandstanding was actually leading to a question. What is the, what is the sort of current school-wide thinking around the uh, appropriateness and sufficiency of the amount of recess that kids have and whether we can, you know, do some things to, to, to lengthen that time and give students more physical education and other activity as a matter of course. And then can we also have some professional development that's provided to teachers that gives them alternative strategies to taking away recess or you know using that as a threat for for behavior management yeah i'll take that mary so i i agree <laughs> with you um jess i think that in part we still have practices that don't support student um, movement. So to, for context sakes, we, we think about time on learning and that's how we build schedules. Yeah. In addition, we have extended learning, we have enrichment, so everything is built around the academics in our district for the obvious reasons. We're an underperforming district mm -hmm. and so the focus is really on academics. I'm a strong believer of movement. I mean, I go crazy yeah. if I'm sitting for your very extended long times. And so it's both a cultural shift and to your point of training and thinking through with our teachers and staff on how do we bring back and incorporate more movement. Now at the Leahy, at, at, at your school in particular, I have seen quite a bit of movement, so thank you for that. And across the district, I do see more movement. As you know, we have schools designed around movement. The Spark is right. uh, one example of that. And so it's gonna take us a while to shift we are going to be adopting restorative practices. I believe that's going to help with this, mm -hmm. but we're, we're gonna get there. But in, okay. in practice, um, it's what's happening, you're right. I have a strong belief about movement. I do not believe in punitive recess taken as a measure of, because it doesn't help, you're right. The research is very clear about movement with students. We're, we're just not there yet. Okay, but it's good to know that we're going to work Philosophically, on it. we agree is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. And I okay. just want to echo what the superintendent said about all of that. You're absolutely right with everything that you brought up. I think you'll be happy to know that we have many school leaders who are also, um, you know, feeling positively about that. Several schools who have increased their recess time as a result. Um, the Leahy School is one of our schools that partners with an organization called Playworks. Yeah. Um, which is an incredible organization that not only helps us with recess and organized play, but trains every teacher in the school for something called class game time. Yeah. So that they have frequent breaks throughout the day and the teachers get training on that. And a uh, little conflict resolution, they do rock, paper, scissors, and you know, they learn ways and um, you know, then we see all kinds of um, disruptions go down as a result of kids having access to these tools. So we're planning to increase. We have several other schools interested now in Playworks for next year. And so all of those resources, all of that professional development, all leads to exactly what you're talking about. Great. 
Um, and I'll, I'll just do one more question so I don't hog the time here. But um, the other thing that I have been hearing about, and I don't have a lot of familiarity with this, but in talking to several school administrators and teachers, it seems that, again, partly maybe because some of the immigration patterns in the city are shifting and some of the students that we're getting now from more Central American countries may also be coming from backgrounds where there was a lot of civil unrest and you know there's trauma that families have experienced in their home country and then there's also you know kind of some of the traumas of living in poverty or if there's addiction issues in a family or so on and i've been reading or hearing a little bit about this idea of trauma informed care and how important and effective that can be in helping students that have behavioral issues or other challenges because they've had very traumatic experiences, you know, whether, you know, through the family or previous political or social environment or whatever it is. And so I'm wondering, you know, are we learning about that as a district and is there professional development being provided to teachers around that? or specialists, or are we adding that capacity so that we can more effectively support students who might be facing those issues? Yeah, not, not yet. We're not systematically training our schools to be trauma sensitive is what we would describe it. Mm -hmm. There are pockets of that happening, in particular at the high school, and there's a lot of interest. Is why we're gonna do restorative practices first, and then June when we come back as a board, I'm gonna talk about that where the district is taken on as a, um, one of the, the ways to think about trauma-sensitive schools under restorative practices, under the SEL umbrella. And of course, Mary's gonna help us lead some of that work. So um, it's definitely on our radar. Okay. Mm -hmm. But not systematically being um, planned for yet because we're taking restorative practices first. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pat? Thank you. Mary, I, I love your presentation. Thank Thanks, you very, Pat. very much for it. It means um, a lot. Let's, let's go to the RTI. Um, how is that going to be structured in the individual schools? Is there going to be like a pre-referral team, the same team that looks at each student referred? And how is that progress monitoring going to happen? Yeah, so there are tools that are available to us that we can use now um, and that will help us kind of um, make sure that we have a more organized way uh, to do these check-ins. And so yes, a team will, will need to be established. I think we'll start with uh, schools that are interested in getting more information and learning more and being part of a pilot um, to ensure. The state is offering um, an MTSS um, overview for school leaders and then they're offering some modules next school year where um, we would like to get some school teams involved in, in that to learn more about how to make that happen in your individual school. But yes, it starts with a team. And that pre-referral that we used to call it is such a misnomer because if we do our job right with RTI, then yeah. we don't really want to get to referral. And pre-referral sounds like something that we're going to do just to, just to get there, right? So what will the team consist of in each school? I what think it will depend positions? on what, what the principal you know, uh, feels is most appropriate. Obviously, you know, the school counselor should be involved, educators should be involved, the school leader should be involved. But we'll talk about that with each, with each school and see what they determine once we um, complete the training and uh, then decide what that's going to look like school by school. All right, and just one more question. Um, your zones, there's an administ administrator at each zone. Is this a new position that we're adding? They're not new. Um, we've been able to um, just use the existing positions and reclassify them um, so that we can make sure that we're doing this. It's, you know, as you can see, it's a minimal number of new positions and we put it all towards student-facing work and um, we're just trying to deal with the numbers that we have and the amount that we have to just increase the support to schools because that's desperately what they're asking us for. So we need to increase that. All right, thank you. You're welcome. No, Amy. No, no, it's you. We have the same question. Oh, you had the same question. Okay. okay. Julia? All set? Oh, Good. Gabby? <laughs> okay. Can I say, I just want to say one Jess, more thing. Yep. I just, I, I think the restructuring with the zone idea is an awesome idea. Thanks. Yeah. I, it, 
just building those connections between the feeder schools. It's and all about the relationships, right? Students. Yeah. All the work I we do in schools great. is all about the relationships. So I appreciate you. And saying. I just want to add, uh, thank you, Mary. That was a very um, complete um, uh, load of information for us. And I'm happy to see that we're all taking into consideration the student as a whole, not just in the school system, but also with the parents and all of their surroundings. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, I'm going to move on uh, at this point to the report of the chair. Um, as everyone knows, um, on April 30th, we uh, passed the fiscal year 2020 budget, um, which is now uh, been moved over to be folded in um, with the city budget and go before um, the city council. So we will um, hopefully see a good result there. But um, I do want to thank everybody again for all their work, especially the superintendent and her team um, uh, in preparing that budget and really working um, everybody through the budget process for um, the first time. We just um, completed uh, the process um, sort of in whole as, as I saw it with a, a professional development uh, session on um, school-based budgeting. Um, what I have begun to do and um, will do uh, prior to June 12th is to debrief with uh, the members of the LAE um, as well as um, folks at DESE uh, and the superintendent um, and sort of get what people thought worked in the budget process, what people thought didn't work in the budget process, what they'd like to see change, what we could do better, um, and bring back uh, a proposal for the June 12th meeting that would basically lay out the budget process for next year, both from a timeline standpoint um, and a substance standpoint. Um, and this is in the hopes of um, getting way ahead of the curve as opposed to what we did this year, which we stated pretty clearly going through that we were learning as, as we went. And so I think it's a process where we'll always look to improve, um, but I think having gone through this first one, I, I think we should see substantial improvement in, in the process, both in terms of budget understanding, but also um, not overburdening um, the superintendent and her team in the preparation, um, the transparency aspects, board input, all of these things, public input, everything, um, that we just um, will have a, a much better process next year. Um, uh, and then recognize that, that there'll always be points that we want to change and whatnot. But, um, so I, I'm, I, and, I, and I have already begun this work, but I will finish this work over the next couple of weeks, um, circulate some sort of um, uh, proposal uh, and, and bring it before uh, the board on June 12th for, um, mm -hmm. for approval. Any questions or anything on budget at this, at this point? I just wanted to add and uh, thank again the leadership team for all their hard work in terms of building this uh, budget, in particular to Mary Lou and Christine who spent countless hours helping us prepare for the budget. Jess? Um, I guess there's a couple of things I want to say. One is I want to thank the superintendent and her team for being responsive to the board request around the structure and format of the budget because it was immeasurably easier to read and understand and I felt like we had a lot more information in the format that it wound up and so that was super helpful and I know it was a lot of work but but that was really great um, the second thing I would just say is that you know I I don't actually know it's an open question for me like it, I know that there was a lot of participation from schools at the around the budgets in each individual school I did not, as a parent that I can recall, but I must admit to being imperfect at checking my child's backpack, like an invitation as a parent to come to the budget hearing at my particular school. 
And I do think it would be good to, now when we know that we're gonna have more time, it's not gonna be as compressed a process next year, but it would be really good, I think, to spend a little energy on parent outreach and engagement in advance of those school budget hearings so that parents could have more of an opportunity to understand and weigh in on the budgets and priorities at the school level. Anything else? It's a um, great feedback. Um, we have a, a few just sort of um, housekeeping items on minutes, but uh, just before we do that and um, adjourn, I just want to note that um, Carla Bear is here, um, and she's been with us before, but uh, in addition to being a former superintendent not too far from here and a, a deputy commissioner at DESE, uh, currently serves as um, superintendent coach for our great superintendent um, as part of the superintendent induction program. We appreciate her joining us tonight. Um, uh, at this time, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the March 13th, uh, 2019 uh, LAE meeting. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All those uh, in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, the uh, uh, minutes are approved. At this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the April 25th, 2019 LAE meeting. So moved. Uh, do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I, I think I need to abstain because I wasn't at that one, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with a uh, vote of uh, four, um, uh, the minutes are approved with four votes in favor uh, and one member abstaining, uh, two members not present. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the April 30th um, special meeting of the LAE. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, the minutes are approved for the uh, April 30th uh, meeting. Are there any um, final uh, comments or anything, Pat? Yes. Um, I think as a group we'd be remiss if we didn't recognize um, that this week is Teacher Appreciation Week, and we need to thank all our teachers for a job well done on a daily basis. So um, thank you, teachers out there. Thank and the you. staff. Thanks for the awesome. reminder, Pat, and congratulations to all the great teachers that we have. Yes, agreed. Exactly. Other um, announcements or um, anything anyone wants to say? Gabby, how is the school year going? Almost done. Stressful but good? <laughs> Stressful but it's going, almost done. She's still okay. smiling. Almost so. there. Yeah, you are still <laughs> smiling. That's a, a great a good sign. testament to you. Uh, all right, at this time, I'll uh, entertain a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Um, all those opposed? Um, the motion carries. We are adjourned until June 12th, 2019, uh, our next monthly meeting. <laughs>